Hello and welcome to the next in our series of Journal Star Editorial Board podcasts that we're doing interviewing each of the Peoria City Council at large candidates ahead of the February 26th primary this year. Uh, today we have with us Andre Allen. Hello, how's it going? Very good. Thank you for being here. A hey, pleasure. Thank you for having this, and thank you for opening this opportunity to the candidates. Really appreciate it. Yep. We're glad to have everyone. I'm Journal Star Associate Editor Chris Kergard, joined with Journal Star Managing Editor Sally McKee. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. And I want to jump right in and, and have you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what it was that made you decide you wanted to run for city council. Sure, sure. Uh, so I'm originally from Peoria, Illinois, Peoria native, uh, alumni of Peoria Public Schools. Uh, I went to Woodrow Wilson, which is now Dr. Maude Sanders. I uh, went to Sterling Middle School, uh, graduated from Richwoods High School, class of 2007. Uh, enrolled at ICC for two years, uh, went there, and then I transferred to Eastern Illinois University, where I uh, completed both my bachelor's and my master's degree. Uh, my career is in higher education. Uh, I've worked as an academic advisor at Eastern Illinois. I've worked at, as an academic advisor, excuse me, at Illinois State University. Um, and recently, I moved back to Peoria in 2016, uh, and I was took a position as a student life and career services coordinator at Methodist College of Unity Point Health. Uh, I was in that role for about a year, um, and then I was elevated to dean of students, and I've been in that role since July of 2017. So I enjoy working in higher education and help students achieve their uh, academic and career goals and, and be in that liaison that they need. Um, you know, I've been involved in a lot of different civic engagement and community service opportunities over the last couple of years since I've been in Peoria. Uh, currently serve on the Peoria Public Schools Foundation Board. I'm on the Urban League, uh, Tri-County Urban League Board of Directors. I have a mentoring program at my old middle school, Sterling Middle School, called the Jaguar Squad. It's a sixth grade male mentoring program. Uh, and just, you know, some other different things as well, too. And I had a really positive 2018. Uh, I was named to the uh, 40 Under 40 uh, IBI Magazine, 40 Leaders under 40 here in Peoria, Illinois as well. And just, you know, I had a very positive year and uh, I wanted to take this next step for us being from Peoria, uh, being a husband and a father and someone who's just extremely vested in the future of this city. I felt like it was my time to take this next step for us. Okay. Excellent. Um, could you tell me a little bit more about the Jaguar program? You have a very impressive list of activities and things oh, that you, you do, you. but I think that um, something like that sounds like a step in helping some of the problems that we have you oh, know, yes. starting at such a young age and yes. so you you were the founder of that and yes. do you have help in that or yes yes and I mean it's, it's very important to plant those seeds early and start at that grassroots level that's how we can really make a change uh, so when I originally came back to Peoria I got involved with the Peoria Public Schools Foundation um, and we have this program uh, called the Horizons Club where they invite guest speakers to come to school and so I saw my cousin she got tagged in a photo on Facebook uh, speaking at of school and I you know I inboxed the Peoria Public Schools Foundation Facebook page and I said hey I would love to come speak I'm an alumni of Peoria Public Schools and they were like sure they were very receptive to me they weren't like who's this creepy guy facebooking me they were like hey he's cool uh, so they gave me three school options and one of them was Sterling Middle School so I was like oh great I went to Sterling and so I immediately we came back and I spoke there a couple of times and I formed a pretty positive relationship with their administration uh, their principal principal Lane and they have a really great counselor there uh, Casey Ahmad she's just wonderful um, and so she reached out to me and she said, hey, would you be interested in maybe starting a male mentoring program? Uh, I've got some fifth graders that I would like you to work with. Uh, would you be interested in doing it? And I was like, awesome. So uh, myself and the two of my best friends, we actually met at Sterling. Uh, my buddy Ty, we met in student council in, se in sixth grade, you know, talking to you about that. So uh, I got them to help me do it as well, too. So we meet with them every Thursday uh, over lunch from 1130 to 1230. Uh, we bring in guest speakers. Uh, we take them on different classroom uh, you know, field trips and things of that nature. Uh, we took them recently to the, they have that new Fortnite gaming system mm -hmm. inside of Landmark Health Club. I didn't even know what Fortnite was <laughs> until they, they told me that. Uh, but to your point, though, it's just very important to start at that grassroots level. So our goal is uh, we started with them in fifth grade, and we'll keep them all the way through eighth grade, and then we'll start back over with some fifth graders once they uh, transition to high school. Uh, but I really want to keep up with them in high school as well, too, because mm -hmm. we know uh, freshman year can be very tough, and we don't want any of them to fall through the cracks. But they're a great group of kids, uh, very spirited. Sometimes I feel like they're thin in my hairline just because, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I know how I was when I was 11 years old. So I just try to have that same patience that I had uh, from teachers. I had some very influential teachers in my life, and I just want to be that, uh, you know, that mentor that they can rely on, uh, someone that they can tell the the good news to. And someone sometimes sometimes we need that person that we can tell the bad news as well too, because none of us are perfect, and we all deserve second chances. All right, excellent, excellent. Re yeah. really neat program. Yeah, thank uh, you. I, I want to. 
jump in and, and have you detail a little bit more. We asked in our questionnaire about a couple of things, in, yeah, including sure. uh, dealing with some of the, the areas of the city that are struggling. Yeah. Uh, and, and you had uh, some thoughts on temporary tax break incentives to, mm -hmm. to help establish businesses yes. in those areas. Walk us through what, what that would mean. Yeah, definitely. So uh, my platform for my campaign is Reboot Peoria. So you'll see the mm -hmm. hashtag Reboot Peoria. It's a four-stage initiative. And the first stage of that is economic development. And what that entails is, you know, what can we do uh, to make Peoria attractive, uh, not only to recruit businesses here, but to retain businesses and homegrown businesses as well, too. So that was one of the things that I suggested is we can look into some sunset tax breaks uh, to help a, a business that is, especially for some of our startups who are trying to get going. Uh, we know in that one to three years, there's so many different barriers that businesses will uh, run into. And if we can just help, help alleviate some of those barriers uh, financially to allow them to grow and they're able to employ our citizens, uh, they're able to contribute to our sales taxes and they're able to contribute to, you know, maybe some of the other different things that we have going on here in our city, you know, whether that's supporting different programs and things of that nature, I think that's very great. Um, you know, one of the things that's really hurting right now in Peoria is our, our sales tax. Our sales tax is declining um, because everyone wants to, you know, order off Amazon. Mm -hmm. But when's the last time Amazon supported your daughter's seventh grade volleyball team? You know, when's the last time they participated in that fundraiser? So we've got to really support those local businesses that support us. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, you mentioned sales tax revenue, which was off almost a half million dollars last year from, yes. Yes. from our projections. Yes. Um, this seems as though it, it's targeted, and I, I want to clarify it, targeted mostly towards small business growth and development, and particularly in those needy areas. Is that fair to say? You know what? Uh, definitely. We definitely need to support our small business, especially in our areas of need as well, too. But also, though, I mean, if there is a, a larger company that would want to entertain coming to Peoria, I think we should definitely look into them as well, too, to see what type of incentives that we can provide to them. That makes financial mm -hmm. sense, though. Um, I don't want this to be a situation where we provide a, a tax break to a large entity and then the taxpayers are going to be the ones bearing the, uh, the, the, the back, mm -hmm. the, you know, trying to recruit those funds that we mm -hmm. alleviated to that big, that big business partner. So we just have to look at every business uh, in every situation, you know, as an individual to ensure that we're making the right decisions at that time. Mm -hmm. Is this something where you would also look toward other government entities to ask them to sign on on, on similar tax relief? I ask because one of the big complaints about, say, a TIF district mm -hmm. has been the, the extent to which it, it ends up really disadvantaging an entity like Peoria Public Schools, yeah. it, losing millions upon millions of dollars yeah. in, in that increment growth. Mm -hmm. And that that's over 25 years. Yeah. But you know, it, would you be asking potentially the school district oh, or, yeah. or the county to, to sign on to also waiving those taxes for the first three years? I think we can definitely look into that. I think collaboration is going to be very, very important moving forward here in Peoria. So I would definitely love to get some of their feedback to ensure that we are all on the same page when making these type of decisions because they ultimately do affect all of us. All right. Uh, you also uh, have a couple ideas for tackling the, the vacant lot program, including yeah. selling off as many as possible of them to, to private owners. And I'm quoting here, so long as we can determine the buyers are legitimate and have positive intentions. Yes. How do we gauge that? Yeah, definitely. So part uh, three of my Reboot Peoria initiative is my housing and infrastructure mm -hmm. initiatives. And so we definitely want to ensure that those who are buying those homes in those areas, because we understand real estate is a very popular uh, employment opportunity and, mm -hmm. um, you know, rightfully so. But we need to make sure that uh, those who are buying homes in those areas are holding them to the standard uh, that our citizens deserve. Um you know, no one likes to live in a home that isn't, you know, with leaky floors or, mm -hmm. you know, you're dealing with, you know, rodents and things of that mm -hmm. nature and stuff, too. And our citizens don't deserve that. So we just need to make sure that as a city government, we have policies uh, that enforce that. Uh, we mm -hmm. need to make sure that our uh, public works team are going in there and they're using their code enforcement uh, procedures to ensure that these homes are at the standard that we're setting uh, for our property owners. Uh, we also want to make sure that we have standards, though, that are achievable. Uh, because we don't want our property owners and our realtors to find themselves trying to uh, achieve things that uh, are out of their scope. So we want to make sure that we meet right in the middle. And that's why it'd be very important to have us all at the table, uh, to have a mutual purpose to ensure that our citizens are living in homes that are productive and positive, but also our property owners are able to achieve that with also allowing them to hit their bottom line as well, too, if possible. Mm -hmm. um, in reading your plan, you also talked about 
some properties, you know, some rental properties being needed as well, and yes. perhaps the city doing some renovation, and then maybe yeah. some of those being public housing. Yeah. So I wasn't sure, would this city then be like the landlord, or was this something that was going to the PHA would oversee? Mm. And um, obviously in all this, you have some great ideas and some... Mm. Uh, things that would be very beneficial mm-hmm. to the city. Yes. Funding is always a problem. Yes. And, and the same with doing those. Um, I, we just ordered a new floor. It's like $1,000 for a tiny little floor. Yes. I mean, you know, yes. home renovations are yes. very, very expensive. So I, maybe you could clarify some of that for me. Yeah, sure, sure, definitely. As a recent uh, homeowner, me and my wife just bought a home. Uh, sometimes we had to just fix our toilet. And I was like, ah, oh, it would have been great <laughs> to just call Larry the landlord to come over here and fix this thing. So I definitely understand that, too. But uh, some of the things that I've been looking into, there are some grants that the uh, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, that can provide that I would like to look into. Uh, they are ch- uh, choice neighborhood grants that can help with some of these renovations um, that we can apply for to help renovate some of these homes um, that we can, if we're not able to sell them, that we can turn them into some public housing type of opportunities that are very affordable for our citizens. So I definitely want to look into grant and private funding opportunities because, again, I don't want this to be an initiative that, again, our citizens have to, uh, you know, carry the, the load. Right. Um, but So I definitely want to look into those funding opportunities to ensure that this is a positive outcome for everyone. And then maybe work with the PHA as far yes. as the management as opposed to the city? You know what? I think that we both can sit at the table. I mean, the mm-hmm. PHA, they've been doing a lot of great things for our city for a long time, and I think that right now resources are very scarce, and we need to just come to the ga- table, excuse me, and we need to collaborate. So I definitely would be open to collaborating with them, and I'm not a person that always feels like we need to reinvent the wheel. Sometimes right. things just need to be tweaked a little bit. Mm-hmm. We've talked a little bit about some of the, the components to this already with business development and, and housing. You're, I'm, I'm sure, familiar with the, the listing of, of Peoria for multiple years on, on the 247wallstreet.com yeah. list of, of yes. worst communities for African Americans. Yes. A lot of that is borne out with, with more definable data in, mm-hmm. in the governing magazine report that, that came out last week, mm-hmm. listing some of those same problems. PR has been well aware of these things for, for a long, long time. Unfortunately. The, the, the city yeah. spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in 2016 uh, bringing in the National Resource Network to put together a report addressing what the city and, and not-for-profit groups in the area need to do to start getting our arms around this and Mm -hmm. and to start one bite at a time addressing it. Yes. Since that report has come out and and since I, as a Peoria taxpayer, Mm -hmm. spent money on that report, there's been virtually no concrete city action on Mm -hmm. it besides a couple of meetings to to gauge further interest. Mm -hmm. How do you get the city of Peoria off the dime? If if you're elected, Mm -hmm. what can you commit to doing to getting the city of Peoria to take more concrete action there? Definitely. So, I mean, I'm going to sit around the table with my fellow horseshoe members and we're, we're going to hit the ground running and it's going to be us coming up with some concrete solutions and us looking to collaborate with some other leaders in our community, us getting out in the community to engage. What do they need uh, to make sure that we are making some actionable steps, uh, coming to meetings with actionable items, leaving the meeting with actionable items as well too, not just having meetings for the sake of having meetings um, and making sure that we are hitting the ground running. So I'm coming, I'm coming in there with the boots on the ground and I'm ready to hit the mm-hmm. ground running for our city. Where, where do you think that the shortfall has been in getting that accomplished so far? In other words, where do you think the failure's been? You know, I don't want to place the blame on any particular, you know, past regime or, or individual, but I just think that we just need to have leaders at the table who understand where our citizens are coming from. We need to have leaders at the table who have been in the shoes of our citizens, and I'm someone mm-hmm. who has been in the shoes of our citizens. I'm a first-generation college student. Um, I'm someone who has student loan debt. I'm, I'm a young father. I'm a young property owner myself, um, and so I'm facing some of the same barriers. And And I understand that, you know, we are all one uh, mishap from, you know, being homeless or or, or losing our job or anything like that. So I'm not uh, I'm not far removed from where our citizens are. I'm I'm right there with them. And uh, I have family who are uh, in the same trenches as them as well, too. I have friends who are in the same trenches as them as well, too. So I'm someone who can really relate to our citizens. And I think that's what we need at the city government level. We need relatability. We need transparency and we need confidence. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue, too. That the one of the difficulties in, in getting any action there has been 
getting through and, and encouraging people in neighborhoods that aren't visibly immediately affected mm -hmm. by the, uh, the entire city is, no question, oh, yeah. affected by these concerns, but, but there are large parts of the city where people can walk out their door and not feel yeah. as though they are. Mm -hmm. How would you as a council member work to, to bring in and engage people in, in those parts of the community and get them mm -hmm. to recognize that these problems need tackled? Yeah, definitely. Um, I had a meet and greet a few weeks ago um, it was pizza and politics, and I gave the metaphor mm -hmm. that Peoria is a heart. Um, and every um, every capillary of the heart or every blood vessel in the heart, it all matters. Mm -hmm. And when one gets clogged, you feel it. And regardless if you live on the north end of Peoria, the east bluff, the south end, or wherever you live at, when one artery gets clogged, the heart feels it, the heart gets weak, and then mm -hmm. the body ultimately suffers. And that's where we're at as a community right now in Peoria. And so when you have, uh, for example, when I look at um, you know, someone as part of the African-American community, well, 17% of us are unemployed. You know, So now that 17% of us are unemployed, but we make up 26% of the population, and you want to know why sales tax is down. You want to know why there's less property owners, so you're not having any property values. Well, that's something that you don't realize that's affecting you because you mm -hmm. live up top. But then you want to know why the sales tax on that gallon of milk just went up. Well, because you have a third of your population and a fourth of them are almost unemployed. I mean, that affects you. So we have to really start connecting the dots and providing that transparency. Um, we have to get to a point where we are as citizens where you can not you can have compassion without actually going through what someone is going through. Mm -hmm. You know, I shouldn't have to um, become homeless to now have compassion for people who are homeless. And so to, so we really have to get to a point where we have compassion for our citizens to understand that we are all in this together. We all need to work together towards solutions in order to make this city great. Are you concerned? You um, mentioned, you know, being a young father and mm -hmm. your job and mm -hmm. you're on several boards. Mm -hmm. Your plate is like a Thanksgiving Day plate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is it is full. Mm -hmm. And so, are you concerned at all, or how do you think you'll be able to balance some of those things? Do you plan on keeping on all the boards, or mm -hmm. is there going to be any type of uh, well, you know what? If I get this, you know, I'm going to have to let go of a couple. Or do mm -hmm. you think you can juggle it all? You know what? Uh, I mean, I'm someone who is not a t-shirt wearer. Um, I'm not someone who uh, I'd rather be good at three things than mediocre at 12. That's something mm -hmm. that's how I've always lived my life. So I'll definitely if, if I do have the pleasure of being elected to yeah. Peoria City Council, uh, me and my wife will sit down and we'll look at life uh, to see, you know, do I need to let some of my other commitments yeah. go? Uh, but also, I'm, I'm not afraid uh, of, of multitasking. You know, I'm, that's effective. I'm an effective leader. This is something that I've been doing my whole life is being able to multitask, especially positive things. So but I mean, I'll have an evaluation period because the last thing I want to do is uh, fall off in some of my current uh, obligations that I have right now, specifically being a, a husband and a father, uh, you know, with two small kids, but then also some of my other civic engagement and community service opportunities. So we'll look at things um, if I'm elected and, and see how we can, you know, use some overlap. And uh, But some of the things that I'm already involved in, like I said, when I think about my mentoring program, you know, I've already got a few guys that help me do it, you know, and, and, and in my opinion, effective leadership is not necessarily what you're doing in the role, but how does the role continue after you leave? And oftentimes, a lot of us, we don't like to pass the ball or we uh, things crumple after we leave. And that's that shows that you weren't an mm -hmm. effective leader because you didn't set the next person up to take your shoes after you left. Mm -hmm. About how long do you anticipate uh, in a given week you'd, you'd be working on city council business if you're elected? Oh, I mean, as, as long as it takes. I mean, I'm ready. I'm ready to put in the work. I mean, it's a part time position, but it take it's going to need full time commitment. And that's something that I'm really uh, willing to do. Um, I have the, you know, the compassion and the energy to really hit the ground running in this position. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to all the opportunities of being able to visit the different neighborhood associations and, and, and meeting with anyone from a CEO of a business to the janitor of a business and, and anybody in between. You know, I want to be that transparent person that the city can count on. I, uh, one thing I said even last week in a forum, I want to be the voice for the voiceless and the hope for the hopeless. And that's something that I will. So no no time limit or, or hours of the day, um, you know, long as my, my wife is okay and happy and such. I might have to take a break to, you know, do some family time here and there, but I'm really ready to commit to this and really, you know, help our city uh, go into a bright future. Have you um, sat down with any of the current council or former council members mm -hmm. and got any mentoring as far as what is involved? 
I have. I have. Uh, not to mention anybody by name. I don't want anybody to feel left out or feel like I have any type of biasness or anything. But but I have, Favorites. though. I have, though. I, I've sat with some current uh, city council, and I've also been connected with some uh, previous city council uh, as well. So just trying to, you know, learn the insides and out. And it's more to it than just meeting uh, at the horseshoe every other Tuesday. So uh, it's yeah. definitely more to it. And uh, I'm prepared for that. And that was something that I factored in before I threw my name in the hat. Mm-hmm. All right. I, you you have an idea, and, and we've seen a, a continued growth in, in public pension fees that, that the city is, is paying. Mm-hmm. We've seen as part of that, that this new fee that was imposed this last cycle yes. uh, in, in the budget to help pay for that through 2021. Uh, they're, they're projecting... Uh, a growth of of eighty million dollars mm-hmm. in public safety pension costs mm-hmm. from now through ten years from now. Yes. You've got a different idea for paying for at least part of the burden for that. Walk us through what that is. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, Peoria is a unique to the pension obligation. I mean, unless something changes at the state legislation, at the state level, as far mm-hmm. as legislation, we're going to have to fulfill our pension mm-hmm. obligations. Uh, so one thing that, uh, you know, me and my team, we've kind of thought of, and uh, our recently elected governor, uh, Governor Prisker, he has definitely um, voiced that he is looking to legalize marijuana. Um, that is something that he is leaning towards. That is something that he pushed for during his campaign, and um, it's something that's most likely going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, not saying that I'm endorsing it either way, but if it's something that is going to happen, then let's let's see what we can do with it positively, and let's turn it into a taxable revenue. Uh, we would have to see what type of uh, restrictions or policies will mm-hmm. come down, um, because we, we saw with the gaming, um, you know, we thought that we were going to be able to make a lot of money off of that, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, uh, that, that didn't work out. Uh, mm-hmm. So hopefully, um, local municipalities will be able to uh, enjoy the dividend uh, if, if marijuana is passed um, as a, you know, is able we're able to sell it and, and tax it, and I would love for us to take some of that tax revenue and put it towards our pension obligations. Um, you know, ironically, it will work out where you know 2021. It, I mean, if it's legalized mm-hmm. by then, that, that would be about the time it would be yeah, coming online. Ex- exactly. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it, it could be a great opportunity. Again, there's a lot of different factors that we'll have to look into, um, but that is something definitely I think that is a forward thinking um, and innovative uh, that I would love for us to explore. Uh, you know, again, we'll just have to kind of see what type of policies and restrictions will come after it is legalized. Mm-hmm. Okay. The city is is also coming off a year with a record tying number of homicides yes. that have occurred and and certainly whether you measure issues in in violence by by homicide or or other report mm-hmm. it's a concern for a number of people who are out there. What what should the city be doing mm-hmm. differently or, or looking at through a different lens in, in terms of how how our police force a, and other departments mm-hmm. work to deal with, with issues of violence? One of the retiring council members has suggested stop and frisk as an option, and, and it sounded like that went over like a lead balloon. Uh, but you know, what, what options do you think are, are on the table and, and which ones aren't for you? You know... Um you know, right now, you know, it, it's very troubling. Um, you know, I lost a, a good friend of mine my senior year of high school uh, to gun mm-hmm. violence here in Peoria. And that's something that me and my close friends, we still really haven't gotten over. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's something that we definitely need to address. But uh, putting a police officer on every corner of Peoria isn't going to stop homicides. It isn't mm-hmm. going to stop gun violence. So we have to look at the uh, the grassroots issues, if you will. Uh, we understand uh, crime and, and violence is correlated to unemployment. It's correlated through your wages. It's correlated if you are educated or if you've been able to have vocational and job training opportunities mm-hmm. that allow you to sustain a life uh, that can deter you from uh, a life of mm-hmm. uh, a life that can lead you towards a life of crime. Mm-hmm. Um, we also understand that those who are coming back from the criminal justice system, it's hard for them to get reintegrated into life. Uh, so, you know, I know there's some uh, criminal justice reform things going on right now that uh, some of our uh, local politicians and state uh, politicians are working on. Um, but we've got to address those issues, though, because um, those will ultimately uh, deter our crime. Um, you know, we got a lot of great mentoring programs going on right now in Peoria. Uh, growing up here in Peoria, every time as a young kid, every Saturday we were playing ball at the Proctor Center, the Carver Center, Salvation Army, YMCA before it was the Dream Center. I mean, 
idle time for a kid is just, you know, I mean, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's so dangerous. And so we have, to, and a lot of those, those programs, um, they've been, they've been strapped, you know, for, for resources, you know, over the last mm -hmm. few years with the state budget issues. And, and so we have to rally as a community to solve this issue of violence, uh, and, and crime. Um, it, it's not necessarily something that city council can pass a policy to make people mm -hmm. stop hurting each other. But if you don't address those, those issues that I mentioned, unemployment and, and job preparation and education, um, then you're not going to be able to overcome the violence, uh, specifically the gun violence that you mentioned in the, towards the homicide mm -hmm. problem. Yeah. Do you think it would be helpful, one thing we talked about as far as minority employment, mm -hmm. the city itself, as min as far as hiring minorities, mm -hmm. is not great. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, say, for example, there were more minority police officers, mm -hmm. how might that, you do something like that, is possible? Obviously, it's kind of hard. I know you talked about they're not, able, they're laying off, they're not hiring. Yeah. So to bring more in, but I'm just wondering if perhaps more role models in that direction, more... Mm -hmm. um, minority officers in some areas that might make people more willing to trust police mm -hmm. and to to work with them as far as helping stop crime? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, any thoughts in that or what could mm -hmm. help the city get a better hiring practices that would mm -hmm. bring in more minorities? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it definitely would help you know, uh, anytime uh, you see someone that looks like you, you just kind of have an instant relatability mm -hmm. that just gets mm -hmm. established, whether that's a, a teacher or, you know, a police officer, a firefighter, yeah. a nurse, you know, um, and it just shows you that, okay, this person, they, they, they might get me. They uh, might understand where I'm coming from. Uh, as you mentioned, unfortunately, with the uh, recent budget that was passed, uh, some of those positions aren't yeah. able to be filled. And so how do you recruit minority uh, officers if you don't have the mm -hmm. positions to recruit them? So, um, you know, ideally, hopefully as a city, when we transfer you know, as we tread forward and we grow revenue, we're able to open up those positions again. We can put a precedence on trying to hire uh, more minority candidates, which I know that the last couple of years I've monitored, you know, I've noticed that, you know, different career fairs that I go to, you uh -huh. know, whether I'm at Peoria High or Manual, you know, on behalf of my job, but I'll notice that, you know, the fire department is there and the police mm -hmm. department is there. So they really have been um, intentional, but we just have to dive a little deeper though. Um, you know, I'm part of the college and career readiness, uh, part of Peoria Public Schools Committee. And, uh, uh, one of the tactics that we have right now is introducing careers as early as kindergarten. Oh. Um, and it's not necessarily making a kid write a resume in kindergarten, but really just kind of planning that seed early. So you have those officers, you know, go to those classes early to uh, help overcome that stigma that police officers uh, have, um, especially within the uh, African American community. Um, it's something that uh, myself, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've had to overcome as well, too, and, and sometimes still struggle to this day. Um, but I'm really trying to practice what I preach and, and look at people as an individual and not uh, allowing, you know, maybe previous experiences to cast my uh, my outlook of that, you know, that person. So I just really try to look at things in a very specific and a narrow scope and really, uh, you know, try to shake that, you know, that past phobia that I once had. Hmm. Even to have the more role models out there to show, well, he, he can do it, I can do it. it. But if there aren't very many out there... Yeah, it's it's tough with uh, my yeah. with my male mentoring program last year. A buddy of mine, he's a sheriff in uh, Vermilion County oh. uh, near Danville, mm -hmm. Illinois, and uh, we brought him back to come talk yeah. to our guys. And um, you know them seeing him, you mm -hmm. know, a, a black man, a sheriff. Uh, you know, he let him, you know, get in, and it was funny. He was like, "This is the only time you get to get in the back seat of a cop car," you know, because <laughs> the kids got to get mm -hmm. inside of the cop car and stuff too. But really exposing them. Mm -hmm. But then also he talked about his past, and he talked about how you know one time he. He was in high school. He got in trouble, and you know he didn't let that deci decision mm -hmm. define him. But he created that relatability for those young people to understand that you know what, just because they have a uniform on, they're humans too, you know, and they have a very tough job and um, and stuff too. So just creating those relatability opportunities is very important um, in order for us to build trust between our community and law enforcement in our city. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you, uh, in, in your questionnaire, you suggested the opportunity of, of bringing garbage collection operations, recycling collection operations back in-house, and likewise that you're open to having the fire department uh, resume handling paramedic service after mm -hmm. the five-year notice would be given on, mm -hmm. on altering that contract. I, and I'm wondering you know, what kind of research you've done on, on what that would do mm -hmm. to city employment costs mm -hmm. and, and, in particular, city pension costs. 
costs to yeah. bring those things back in house, as well as the cost recovery on the the bringing ambulance mm-hmm. back in town. Because that 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 was one of the things the Journal Star had researched back when when it was debated mm-hmm. decades ago. What was that? You know, the city really was having difficulty recovering those costs mm-hmm. and having an outside vendor taking care of that. That that put that on them rather mm-hmm. than on on the city mm-hmm. to recoup those costs and, mm-hmm. and have to balance its budget after losing that money. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I mean, you know, those are just things that I think that at this point, you know, nothing's really off the table right now for our city. I think we just have to really just look at uh, those services that we are currently uh, outsourcing um, mm-hmm. to see, you know, is, is it realistically is it realistic for us to bring those mm-hmm. back and do those feasibility studies as well um, to ensure? Because, like you mentioned, I mean, if you do bring those services back to us, then you add those people those positions to our pension costs, mm-hmm. um, and if that's something that you know strategically as a city, that's something that we're able to afford. So, you know, when I made those statements and you know, and I mentioned that in my questionnaire, it just shows me shows and demonstrates that I'm just open minded, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to you know any type of solutions at this time uh, but some of those organizations that you know we are utilizing their services they employ our citizens and they do a lot of great community service work as well too for our our, uh, our city and our citizens as a whole too but I'm just open-minded right now and I think that there's just at this point we just have to really just start looking at everything and just seeing what's feasible and what's not feasible Okay, uh, we're coming up on on the end here, and I think we want to both ask you a, a couple of philosophical sort of questions and, yeah, sure. and big picture sort of things. Uh, you're going to be elected uh, in 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 your desirable campaign. Mm-hmm. You're on the council. Your most important number is six. Mm-hmm. You got to get five people to vote with you and have mm-hmm. six votes to implement any policy. Mm-hmm. Talk about how you work with fellow council members to get them to agree with you, pr- mm-hmm. particularly among people who disagree with you. How do you do that? Well, you know, I try to use my crucial conversation uh, skills and to try to establish mutual purpose mm-hmm. um, and to see um, if we are not agreeing, uh, figure out, okay, well, what, what, what are the barriers right now if what we're not agreeing? And there's mm-hmm. a way for us to meet in the middle. Um, I'm not someone who has an ego that's, that is my way or the high highway. Um, I understand that you have to negotiate. Um, and I have great collaboration skills and communication skills as well, too. So I think that whoever is on the council with myself, I think that I would be open to any ideas they have. Uh, I'm very passionate as well, though, so I'm not going to be ran over. But uh, at the same time, though, uh, this is bigger than Andre Allen. Um, and it's it's bigger than the city council. It's about the Peoria, uh, the city of Peoria, excuse me. So, you know, I'm going to just go in and with an open mind and, 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 and sit down with them and, and see where they're coming from from and see how we can meet in the middle uh, in order to pass the best policy for our citizens. Mm-hmm. And you obviously have a lot of great ideas and things that you want to do, and, and clear your passion does come through. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's going to be difficult to do everything you want. It and is. so if you had to narrow it down, if you're elected, what would be, if you had to, to choose one, your number one priority of what you would like to get done? Uh, really fostering partnerships with Peoria Public Schools. I think that our public school system is a uh, great recruitment and retention school uh, tool, excuse me, for our citizens. Uh, people will come and stay in a city based off of the school system. Um, it has a direct effect on property values. It has a direct effect on job training. It has a direct effect of job readiness. Uh, and so that's something that I really uh, have passionate for, uh, to really just see how we can best support our, our public school system. Uh, I always ask the question, um, what would the neighborhoods look like if Manuel High School was the number one high school in the Peoria metro? And that is something that if you think about it, it's just like, wow. And that shows you how important our school system is. Um, I know that, you know, Peoria Public Schools isn't a necessarily a line item of, of city council, um, but city council, though, uh, can work collaboratively uh, with the Board of Education and, and, and Peoria Public Schools administration to ensure that we're just doing our due diligence to uh, help out. I know recently Peoria Public Schools was able to get access to TIF funds, which was very mm-hmm. important, uh, especially, spe- specifically spe- uh, the last couple of years with the state budget crisis and not getting mm-hmm. funds from the state of Illinois. So, you know, that's an example of just working collaboratively, um, and that's something that I really want us to just move that needle to because our kids are our future and uh, the youth is just so important uh, for the direction of the city. Mm-hmm. If you're elected to the council, you, you're going to have access to some information that maybe members of the general public don't have on personnel matters mm-hmm. or don't always care to look at mm-hmm. on some of these big complex topics. Uh, 
So you're going to be probably one of the 11 most informed people making a decision on something. Mm -hmm. You're also going to be hearing from a lot of people in in your constituency throughout the city Mm -hmm. telling you what they want you to do or what they don't want you to do on some things. How do you balance those two things between something that that you may have information that that convinces you this is is the right way to go, Mm -hmm. but you got people calling in and, and 80% of them are telling you go this way instead. Yeah. What do you, what do you do when you get a situation like that? That's, that's very tough. Um, but that's when I try to provide as much transparency as I can. That is within, uh, legal <laughs> matters. <laughs> uh, and also as far as just keeping, um, the prestige of the council as well too, because there are things that us as a council, we're going to know, uh, that our citizens don't know. So just try to provide just that transparency, uh, as much as I can um, with with also just keeping the prestige of, of what we're doing as, as a council uh, and, and establishing the trust of my constituents as well, too, to let them know that I wouldn't make a decision out of ill will or to deliberately put you in a bad place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I understand tough decisions have to be made. Uh, I don't I don't think that a couple months ago, our council just woke up one day and said, hey, let's let's cut. You know, let's cut these jobs or let's not fill these positions or let's let's add this fee to property owners and things of that nature. I mean, that's not something they woke up, but they had to make a tough decision because, um, you know, where we are right now as far as our budget crisis. But, you know, again, I'm just going to be I'm going to try to do the best I can. I'm going to, you know, especially running at large. You know, you are you're not necessarily serving a specific uh, district. So you have to balance, you know, everyone's needs. And it's it's very tough. Um, But just to let them know that, hey, I'm going to do the best that I can for you and uh, just know that at the end of the day I'm going to make the best decision for the group of the whole. Mm-hmm. Okay, voters have a choice to make on the 26th and then uh, if you make it through and, and into the runoff they got another choice to make on April 2nd. Mm-hmm. Why you instead of the other 14 people running? I know. Well, this is Andre W. <laughs> Allen, number lucky number 14 on the ballot there. Uh, and definitely, uh, please uh, vote for me. Uh, I'm a native of this city. Uh, I'm someone who understands what you all are going through right now. Uh, uh, I'm going to really bring that relatability and that transparency back to city council. Uh, I'm someone who is going to work hard for you. I'm going to uh, answer your calls. I'm going to answer your emails. I'm going to ans- answer your Facebook messages. <laughs> I'm going to go above and beyond for this city because I truly care uh, about this city. I am vested here. Um, I'm looking forward to the the, the bright future of Peoria. Um, I think that our best days are in front of us. I truly believe that. That's not pie in the sky. That is something that I'm just really believing in right now. So definitely consider voting or no, not even consider. Please vote Andre W. Allen for Peoria City Council, uh, number 14 on the ballot. If you would like to reach out to me, you can contact me uh, at my Gmail, allenforpeoria.com, on Facebook and Instagram, Andre W. Allen. And also you can visit my website, uh, allenforpeoria.com. All right. Andre Allen, at-large city council candidate, thank you for coming in. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank Mm -hmm. you. Nice to meet you. Thank you.